This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. I'm Carlin Center. I'm a primary care sports medicine physician here at UCSF in the Department of Orthopedics. And we'll spend the next hour or so talking about sports-related concussion, a hot topic in sports medicine. As we go, I'm happy to take questions. Uh, so please let me know, you know as we go if things come up. And uh, hopefully we'll have a chance to you know, take lots of questions at the end as well. So like I said, I'm a primary care sports medicine physician. And not everyone knows what that is. Um, basically, I'm trained to take care of any problem that an athlete has. And my main goal in practicing medicine is to help people be active. So I take care of knee pain and <laughs> shoulder pain. I also take care of problems where, you know, sort of medicine interacts with sports. So things like bone health in someone who's had a number of stress fractures or anemia in a runner and a track and field athlete and what does that mean for them. So kind of where internal medicine overlaps with Sports medicine is my area. I also cover football. All of us in sports medicine do a lot of sports coverage. And during the fall, I spend a lot of time on the sideline of high school football games. Anyone recognize where this is? This is Washington High School, the Eagles. And the location? Keys are. This is the Turkey Bowl game. So uh, the San Francisco Unified School District has their uh, city championships on Thanksgiving every year at Keysar, and this was a few years ago. Washington played Mission, the Bears, and Brown. Washington lost. It was sad for me because I'm the team doctor at Washington, um, but, uh, but it's always fun to be out there, and it was a pretty muddy day, which also is fun for football. So I run our concussion program, our sports concussion program uh, in sports medicine. About a year ago, we started the Bay Area Concussion and Brain Injury Program here at UCSF which is a collaboration between UCSF Medical Center, Benioff Children's Hospital, and San Francisco General Hospital. And I'll talk a little bit more about that at the end. So there's been a lot of focus on concussion recently, and we know concussions are common. We'll talk about how common they are, talk about what is a concussion, how to evaluate and treat a concussion, what are the long-term effects, and prevention. So how common are concussions? You'll see as this talk goes on, there are a few biases. I should have done my disclaimers. I trained at UCLA. You'll see some UCLA pictures. You'll also see some non-USC photos. Uh, <laughs> I grew up in the East Bay. I'm an A's fan. You'll see some A's photos as well. But um, concussions are common. So when you think about a football team, you know how many players on a football team each year get concussed? This has been studied in college football and found to be around 5%. But actually, if you study it further and think about how many we miss, it's probably about 15% of any college team each year. And so it turns out we do miss concussion. We probably miss about 50% of concussion. And this was studied uh, about 10 years ago now in Minnesota. What these researchers did was they took high school football players in Minnesota and taught them at the end of their season the definition of concussion. And then they said, well, how many of you had a concussion? And then they said, how many of you were diagnosed with concussion? And it turned out that there were twice as many kids that had symptoms of concussion as were formally diagnosed. And so they followed up that finding with questions to the kids. They said, well, you know, how come you didn't report your symptoms? And so what do you think? What do you think the high schoolers said? Why wouldn't the high schoolers you know, report their symptoms? So because they wouldn't, wouldn't be able to go back and play? Sure, what else? They didn't know what's going on. Maybe they didn't know what was going on. Yeah, what if they just didn't know? 
Anything else? It's, kind of, it's like a culture of not complaining. Yeah, it's a culture of not complaining. So there's kind of a machismo that goes along with sports, football in particular, and maybe they just want to you know, own up to these symptoms. You guys are right on. So I think this is interesting. You know, looking at the percentage, so 66% of these athletes, these student athletes, didn't think that their uh, symptoms were serious enough to need attention. Now, granted, this is 2003, and this research was probably done, you know, in the t in 2000. So lots of cha lots has changed since then. But I think that's really an important point. Also, people didn't want to leave the game. So 40% of kids said, "Well, yeah, I didn't I didn't want to quit playing." 36% didn't know that their symptoms were concussion. So again, pointing to education being really important here. And of course, 20% didn't want to let down their teammates. So as concussion has become more uh, focused on in sports medicine, there's also been legislation across the country uh, really focused on high school concussion um, recognition. 49 states have adopted youth concussion laws as of last fall. California's law uh, went in, uh, came into effect uh, January 2012. And all of these laws really have three aspects. So the first aspect is that kids, have, kids and their parent or guardian every year have to sign a concussion information sheet, educating them about the signs and symptoms of concussion and the appropriate treatment. The second part is that an athlete who's suspected of having a concussion has to come out of play that day, and they have to stay out of play. So if they're injured at you know, the first part of a multi-game tournament on a Saturday, they have to stay out that whole day. And the third part is that an athlete can only return to play after they're cleared by someone who's trained in the evaluation and treatment of concussion. So that's the three parts of the California law, and those three parts are uh, fundamental in most of the laws across the country. All right, so now I need your help. So we're going to figure out which sports have the highest incidence of concussion. So this is a study done in high school sports. And they put these sports in order of highest to lowest incidence rate of concussion. So, so I want you to do that. So boys soccer, girls soccer, football, boys lacrosse, girls lacrosse. So take a moment, think about that, and take a pen and write down highest to lowest incidence rate. Whatever you think. Oh, the 50th state, I, th I think, it, the question was, what is the 50th state that doesn't have a concussion law? I think it might be Missouri, but I can't, it might, I, it's an M. It's either <laughs> Missouri or Mississippi, but I can't remember off the top of my head. Okay, everyone have their top five or their listing. Okay, so now I want you to confer with someone next to you and see you know, if there's any discrepancy, if there are any questions you have that your neighbor can answer, kind of come up with what you think is the best between your neighbor. OK. So are there any questions? Sometimes there are questions I can answer that would help you really commit. So are there any questions? Yes. Oh, I didn't mean to imply that this was the proper listing, just that these are the options. Yeah, so we'll look at what the, what the highest to lowest is, but these are just, you know, which of these do you think is highest? Good question, yes. So are you better protected with a helmet? So the question is, are you better protected with a helmet? The answer to that is we don't have a helmet that reduces the risk of concussion right now. Good question, other questions? Okay, I have a question for you. Is there any difference between boys and girls lacrosse? Yes. yes. What's the difference? Helmet. 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 So boys lacrosse is a collision sport. Boys wear helmets. Girls lacrosse is not a collision sport. No helmets. All right. Is there any rule difference between boys and girls soccer? No. 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 Okay. So everyone's got their, so what's, what do people think is the highest risk, highest incidence? People think football. Any, anyone think something else? Some lacrosse. I hear girls soccer. Okay, so, you know, some, what about lowest risk? Girls soccer, I hear. Any other? 
girls lacrosse. Okay, let's look. All right, so incidents in high school sports. So here's how it breaks down. So football, highest incidents. Lowest, boys soccer. Interesting, huh? Girls soccer, second highest. And look at the difference between the incidents between girls soccer and boys soccer. And that's something that's been shown in a number of studies that girls have a higher risk of concussion than boys looking at high school athletes. We, we don't know why. There are lots of hypotheses. No one's sure. But that's something that's been borne out in research. Boys lacrosse more than girls lacrosse. All right. So getting on to the definition of concussion, what is a concussion? Concu for a concussion to exist, there must be trauma. There has to be an event. So a concussion is a blow to the head, neck, or body that leads to a force to the head. There's neurologic impairment that occurs within about 48 hours of the blow. It does not have to occur right away, and in fact, often we see delayed presentations of concussions. So I'll be on the sideline of high school football on a Saturday. Everything seems fine, but we get a call Monday morning at one of the, one of the kids is injured. And so there's often a delayed presentation to concussion. Symptoms, though, tend to present within 48 hours of the injury. Also, there's a sequential resolution of symptoms, often within one to two weeks. And these symptoms typically resolve spontaneously. The symptoms represent a functional or metabolic change in the central nervous system. And they may or may not include loss of consciousness. Standard neuroimaging, like a CT scan or an MRI, in concussion is normal. So there's no changes that we can see on your standard CAT scan or MRI of the brain in concussion. Yes, question. Um, so the question is, you know, the third point here says that the symptoms resolve spontaneously, and the question is as opposed to with some treatment. And um, Yes, we'll talk about treatment, and presently in concussion, there's, there's not really a specific intervention. Okay, so concussion symptoms. What are, what are the symptoms of concussion? Dizziness, Dizziness nausea, headache, headache loss, of focus. loss of focus, like a fogginess. Yeah, players will come off the field, ah, I'm just, I can't get the plays like I usually can. Or they're in Spanish class, you know, Spanish is usually easy for me, but I'm not understanding Spanish. What's going on? What else? People should be the same. People should be the same. Mm -hmm. Irritability. Irritability, yeah. Anxiety, emotional symptoms. Absolutely. Loss of memory. Loss of memory, amnesia. Speech Say it again. You know, people, uh, the question was speech impediment. People can have feeling like they're struggling to find the right words, um, but it would be a little bit atypical to say have difficulty forming words. So I think of concussion symptoms in terms of four spheres. So you have physical symptoms, and those would be the most common symptom being headache, dizziness, sometimes an upset stomach, cognitive symptoms, feeling foggy, feeling like you're not as quick as normal, emotional symptoms. Emotional symptoms are frequently forgotten in concussion, but honestly, it's one of the easiest ways for us on the sideline to pick up that someone on the football team's concussed because they look really upset. Not all the time, but sometimes. You know something's up. They'll be tearful. Mm -hmm. Tearful, anxious, irritable. Irritable sometimes. Um, and sleep. Typically, concussion leads to fatigue, and people need to sleep <laughs> a lot more than they're used to sleeping. Sometimes people have trouble sleeping, but the most common thing is fatigue. So the question earlier was, well, what is this injury? What is What's the pathophysiology of concussion? And this is what we know about concussion. This comes out of UCLA. This is from an animal model. And this is what we know. So there's a force to the brain. And that force to the brain basically stretches the axons in the brain that leads to dysregulation of ion channels. At the same time that you have the cellular dysregulation of the axons, the nerves in the brain, you also have vasoconstriction, so the blood vessels tighten up. So the, the cells need sugar because they're dysfunctional. They need sugar to repair, but there's actually less blood flow than normal. And so that results in what we call an energy crisis. 
and that results in concussion. From that, you can kind of abstract to the various symptoms that you see. It makes sense that fatigue would follow this. All right, so how do we evaluate concussion? I'll talk about what we do on the sideline and what we do in the office. And I think it's most exciting to talk about this as if you are the doctor, because being a team doctor is exciting and fun. So I'm gonna put you in the shoes of the team doctor with this case, okay. So picture yourself on the sideline of Key, you know, at Keysar during the Turkey Bowl as the team doctor, okay. So you have a 17-year-old high school varsity football player who takes a hard hit at the end of the second quarter and he's slow to get up. He stumbles to the sideline towards you and tells you he's got a headache and he's got dizziness. One second later, the coach looks at you and says, Doc, is he good to go? <laughs> All right. Does this student athlete have a concussion? Okay. Well, he didn't lose consciousness. So do you need to lose consciousness to have a concussion? No. no. Correct. And interestingly, loss of consciousness actually doesn't even correspond to the severity of concussion. What about amnesia? Let's see, he, re he remembers everything. So do you have to have amnesia to have a concussion? No, that is also correct. Okay, so again, the coach looks at you and says, Doc, is he good to go? And so what do you say? Do you say A, yeah, he's good, football's supposed to hurt? B, no, he needs a CT scan, you're gonna send him to the emergency room now. C, you're gonna admit him to the hospital. Or D, you're concerned he might have a concussion and he's out for now. I would also do D. So you're concerned, you gotta do an evaluation, and you're letting the coach know right off the bat he can't go back in, at least not just yet. Exactly. And so thinking about concussion evaluation, basically from a, a team doctor standpoint, you know, this is kind of the way I think about um, emergencies on the field. You know, you have an athlete down, and very quickly you make a decision about do you need to call 911 or not? And so we're on the field, you know, really trying to rule out emergencies. And those emergencies would be, um, you know, someone who has a cardiac arrest, someone who has a cervical spine emergency, someone who has an open fracture. Those patients, you cannot bring them to the sideline. You need to call 911. It's very clear. That is very unusual, thankfully. And so most of the time we're here and we're bringing the athlete to the sideline to do more of an evaluation. And so in a concussion case, this is what that looks like. This is how we practice at the high school level. This is what happens at the college level. We do a sideline concussion evaluation. We take the player out. We ask the player what happened. You know, and that's doing two things. One, it tells you what happened. Two, it tells you if they're oriented. We use something called the Maddox questions, which are simple orientation questions that have to do with the scoreboard. So focusing here. UCLA 13, USC 9, fourth quarter. You know, asking who's winning the game? What direction were you going when you got hit? Who did we play last week? Things like this, basic memory questions. I try not to ask questions that I don't know the answer to, like what'd you have for breakfast? Not helpful, you know, I, don't, I have no idea. So basic, basic questions, those are the Maddox questions. And then we always do a thorough neck and neurologic examination. And again, this is kind of repeating what you did on the field, really to rule out a neck emergency or a head emergency. And those would be a cervical spine fracture, a spinal cord injury, or you know, bleed in the brain. And so our patients, so we're back to our 17-year-old who's come to the sideline. He's told you he has a headache and he has dizziness. He tells you he has no history of concussion. He was wearing a helmet and a mouth guard at the time of injury. He has a headache and dizziness and he feels kind of foggy. You do a full examination asking him the Maddox questions, doing a neurologic exam and a neck exam, and his exam is normal. He's oriented, he knows where he is, he can tell you reliably that his neck isn't hurting and he can move all of his limbs normally. All right, so this is where we are. And so what is your next step? 
What's our next step with this guy? Take his helmet. Aha. Yes, the sports medicine doctor out there. You must take his helmet. So first thing is, you know, do we think what he has a concussion? Yeah, I think we all think we're suspecting he has a concussion. And so then, you know, you've got this 17-year-old. There are about, you know, let's say 60 other guys out there. They all kind of look the same in pads and helmets. How are you going to keep him out? Indeed, you take his helmet. Um, the CDC always says, when in doubt, sit them out, which I think is you know, a handy thing to keep in mind. And we take the athlete's helmet. We tell the whole staff that the athlete's out, has a concussion, and then in the locker room do a more complete mental status exam. For the complete mental status exam, we use a document called the SCAT-3, and that stands for the Sport Concussion Assessment Tool. It's a validi validated tool that we use to measure delayed, uh, immediate and delayed recall as well as balance. And so we use this, I like to use this initially when I see the student athlete, and then I like to use it each time I see him back in clinic. It provides a nice um, organized way to assess that someone's getting better or not getting better. There's also new, um, in the past year, a child SCAT-3, which applies to kids ages 5 to 12. So for the sideline, what we do is we really monitor symptoms. Because in rare cases, a concussion looks like a concussion, but it actually might be a slow bleed in the brain. And so you really want to keep an eye on the student athlete and make sure that nothing's changing dramatically. You know, you want to make sure they haven't become disoriented or that their headache hasn't become a 10 out of 10 terrible headache all of a sudden. So we repeat our exams on the sideline about every 10 minutes or send the athlete home with a parent or guardian. Overnight, I do tell parents and guardians to wake their student athlete up, which I would say is not evidence-based. That's totally art of medicine what I do and somewhat controversial, but, um, but we do tell our, our parents and guardians to wake the student athlete up overnight. Oh, the question is, how often would you wake them up? A couple times, you know, make sure that they, you know, the, the argument against that is, well, aren't they going to wake up and not know where they are? <laughs> As, you know, yes, but you want to make sure that they're kind of themselves. Um, so the things to watch out for, so concussion symptoms do evolve, and sometimes things get a little bit worse over the first two days, and generally then things get better. Things should not get much, much worse. And so reasons uh, to think that this is not a concussion would be a headache that's much, much worse all of a sudden, or seizures, or repeated vomiting, slurred speech. These are signs that something more serious is going on. Really increased confusion, weakness of an arm or a leg, loss of consciousness. These are all reasons that we tell our parents, if any of these occurs, you have to call 911. Question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a good question. So the question is, you know, in these instances, I think the question is kind of, is there something less than a concussion that can occur in these high in these collision sports? You know, is and and I think we don't really know. I think um, sometimes student athletes do have a fleeting headache and maybe they don't say anything. And right now, we don't have a sensitive tool to measure those injuries. Um, we'll talk in, later on about what we're doing to kind of get there and get to a sense of how can we quantify the injury that happens when you get hit and you have a three-second headache. Is that, is that significant? Do we need to worry about that? I think right now we don't know. Yeah, in the back. What are we considering the weakness of an arm or leg? What are we Oh, so the question is, you know, if the patient had weakness of an arm or a leg, what would we be concerned about? I'd be concerned about some kind of hemorrhage in the brain. It could also be a spinal cord injury. Yeah. All right. So um, whenever we diagnose a concussion at the sideline, we try to provide a handout to our parent or guardian as they leave because this is a lot of information to impart on the sideline of a football game. And so um, it's always a good idea to... Uh, send folks home with a list of things to watch out for. Typically, after we, you know, being the team doctor now that you've been in the shoes, uh, the next question, literally the moment after you say, I think you have a concussion, the student athlete will then say, can I play in next week's game? <laughs> yeah, just like, you know, it's Saturday, right? So the next game is until next Saturday. And that is what they will ask you. Can I play, okay, I have a concussion, can I play in next week's game? That's going to be the next question. Um, 
And I, I typically respond with what I consider to be the number one sports cliche. Anyone know what I'm thinking? <laughs> yeah, it's what the coach always says, you know, hey, Bob Melvin, are we going to win the World Series this year? And he'd be like, well, Carlin, you know, we're going to take it one day at a time. That's, <laughs> that's always what they say. And that's always what I say when someone asks me if they can play in next week's game. The reason is that concussion, right now, we don't really have any tools to tell you how severe your injury is. It's not like a broken arm where I can say, oh, this is tremendously displaced. You need to have surgery. And then in six weeks, it will heal and da, da, da. No, we don't have that yet. I think we will have that. But we don't have that right now. So right now, what we have is a clinical diagnosis that we know gets better with time. And we know, in general, it takes a few weeks to get better. Historically, we used to grade concussion based on how long people lost consciousness and whether or not they had amnesia. And so you used to hear um, that people had a grade one, two, or three concussion. And what happened is that over time, it was found that loss of consciousness and amnesia didn't actually correlate with how long someone had symptoms. And so that's been put aside. And presently, really, the only way I can tell you how bad your concussion was was when you're better. And I know how long you had symptoms for. Yeah. So the question is, why is loss of consciousness not indicative of the severity of concussion? The why, I'm not, I don't know. I think the, the reason we've abandoned that is that it hasn't been proven to be true. So what we've seen is that when you take a group of uh, people who've been concussed and you look at duration of loss of consciousness, it does not correlate with the duration of symptoms. Mm -hmm. So the question is, what if your only symptom is loss of consciousness? Certainly that person would be held out. And depending on the duration of loss of consciousness, they may or may not be taken to the hospital, let's say, if they're a football player. Call it a With loss of consciousness, you would definitely call it a concussion, at least. Mm -hmm. Yes? Is there a correlation between the symptoms and the area of brain impact? Uh, the question is, is there a correlation with the symptoms and where the impact occurred? Um, and that's a question I, I think we don't know. You would think, based on anatomy, that depending on where the blow is. The, um, the issue is that what happens in a concussion is that the brain is like, um, is like is sitting in basically a bowl of jello. And so it's going like this when you get the injury. And so you, though you may get hit here, you may have a contra coup effect such that you actually have the impact on the opposite side. So it's, it's a tough thing to study um, because if you're looking at film and trying to say, well, this student athlete got hit here, so thus he must have these symptoms, getting hit here doesn't actually mean that the brain was injured right here. No, I mean, where the brain was injured. It's both, yeah. I think we don't, uh, and we'll talk about kind of the research that's being done. We don't understand exactly if it's, you know, there's concern that the impact to the brain has more to do with a shear force than a direct linear force, and that has to do with stretching of axons. The, um, we don't have the testing presently to really link, say, the axon dysfunction to symptoms. Does, does that happen at different levels in the brain? Is it all the cortex, or could you have concussion at deeper levels? The question is, does that happen at all levels of the brain, just the cortex or deeper? I don't think we, we know. Further testing for concussions, so I've talked about how abstract concussion is. There is a lot of work being done on trying to make concussion a more, trying to make the tools more objective. And one of those is neuropsychological testing, which is done on a computer. There are brief neuro, neuropsychological tests that can be done by computer. There are extensive tests that can be done by neuropsychologists. The brief testing is used by many of us who see patients with concussion. It's also used in the NFL, NHL, all pro sports. Um, and what that does is the concussed patient sits down in front of a computer for 20 to 30 minutes and does um, tests which measure recall, reaction time, visual memory, verbal memory. Typical symptom resolution in concussion, symptoms typically take 7 to 10 days to get better. That's on average. Other data, some studies show that about 50% of people get better in one week, 90% in three weeks. And generally, we think high schoolers may take longer than college athletes to get better. Certainly, we're more conservative in d 
developing brains than in uh, developed brains in treating concussion. We do think there's a risk of premature return to play, and this has a few parts. So one risk is the risk of repeat concussion. And so this kind of goes back to the pathophysiology that we talked about in the beginning, where the axons get stretched and there's an energy crisis. And that study was done in uh, animal models and mouse models. And what they found is that those uh, pathophysiologic changes last about 7 to 11 days. And then this study came through, again, 10 years ago in JAMA. This was a big study in NCAA football players, and they looked at football players uh, over about six years and looked at uh, athletes who were concussed. And part of the study, they, they looked, they focused at players who were concussed twice in one season. They found that one out of 15 players with a concussion had a repeat concussion in the same season. And really interesting is that the majority, 92% of those, were in the first 11 days after that first injury. The vast majority were really in close succession with the first index event. And, and that's interesting because it kind of lines up with that animal data about when these ion fluxes and when this energy crisis is occurring. So we do think potentially there's a window of vulnerability in those 7 to 11 days. Yes? Um, I, I think these did, they didn't look at the, uh, the question was, does this imply that it was the same place, like that the same area of the brain was injured? Yeah. Kind of don't know. This was a study, they didn't do any imaging, and there's, they're really, right now, we don't have any imaging to sort of localize exactly the, like you can't see the bruise. It's a great question. So why, why is there this vulnerability? You know, is it something having to do with the brain cells and they have a lower threshold so that a lower, a, you know, a more subtle blow could cause an injury? Or does, or does that have to do with loss of coordination or loss of reaction time or poor peripheral vision? All great questions, you know. Yeah, so you look at this and you say, well, geez, I can fix that problem. Just keep all student athletes out of concussion for two weeks. You know, and, and people sometimes do that, you know, based on this data, just say, hey, there's no way anyone can go back in less than two weeks. I'll tell you, you know, that works for a lot of cases, but not every case. You know, there, we really do treat concussion on a very individual basis. Um, the majority of cases, yeah, they'll need to be out a couple weeks. Some cases, maybe not. There is concern about something called second impact syndrome, and this is why we're particularly cautious about returning adolescents to play. Second impact syndrome is a phenomenon um, where, w that has been seen where a student athlete has a concussion and returns to play and then suffers a second blow which leads to brain swelling and actually death. This is very, very rare. It's only been reported as case reports, and so I would say the science behind this, this um, is, is weak. But, um, but, you know, it's a um, severe consequence of a head injury. And so those of us who treat concussion are particularly in tune with uh, being cautious about returning student athletes and making sure that people are 100% better before they go back to contact sports. Okay, so moving on to treatment. How do we treat concussion? All right. Oh, question. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Edema. What is edema? Edema is swelling. All right. So going on to concussion treatment. How, so how do we treat concussion? Rest. Rest. That is correct. Rest. That is where we are with concussion treatment. I think, you know, uh, when I give this talk five years from now, I think that'll, that'll be different. But presently, what we do in concussion is we treat with rest. And we treat, and that's why I have this, this picture up here. Um, I wish that we had, you know, like a brace or some kind of sling because concussion, when you have a concussion, um, you look like you're fine. And often, um, if you have a concussion, people think that you're fine. And it, it actually, I think, would be helpful for student athletes who have a concussion to kind of have, you know, like a sling. And that way, it would, they would clearly have an injury and, you know, there wouldn't be kind of sometimes questions about, do you really have an injury? You look okay to me. You know, these kinds of things. Um, treatment for concussion is rest. So cognitive rest, physical rest, medication for headache. We hold off on Tylenol acutely 
Again, not, this is not a strong evidence base behind this recommendation, but Tylenol is, is best acutely and we hold off on ibuprofen for the first three days or so because of the theoretical risk of bleeding. Ibuprofen um, makes the blood thinner and so we treat with Tylenol first off. I recommend people not drive after they have a concussion and not drink alcohol. Alcohol does not help you recover from a concussion. So the question is, so the reason you want to evaluate the student athlete is not, is, is to make sure that they don't go back and get another concussion. And that is a real um, important point, is really the treatment first off is to take the student athlete out of play. Secondly, we do think that people do better if they rest up front. Um, and there's actually, this, is, this was just published, good data out of um, Boston Children's about cognitive rest. For a long time in concussion, we focused on resting from physical activity, but there's this new data that shows that resting from cognitive activity is also important. What they did in this study is they looked at 335 patients, average age 15, prospectively. They saw these kids within three weeks of their concussion and they completed, the patients completed a scale measuring their cognitive activities since their last visit. And what the researchers found is that the kids who had done more cognitive activity had symptoms for longer. They had more symptoms for more time, which, is, which implies, you know, therefore the kids who had done less, who had rested more, seemed to get better faster. And so we do recommend cognitive rest. And what that means is <coughs> decreasing or trying to avoid entirely texting, video games, reading, online stuff, surfing the web, computers, schoolwork. This is all, you know, it depends on who you're seeing and how symptomatic they are with these things. I don't categorically take people out of school. Um, but if someone comes to me and says, you know, geez, I feel just really sick and dizzy when I'm reading, they probably need a little bit of time off from reading. So we do make accommodations. It's a good idea not to try to multitask when you're having a concussion. It just really will make the symptoms worse. Our principle is first return to learn, then return to play. In our clinic, we provide a note that's very clear for the school that indicates our expectations as far as what the student athlete would benefit from if they need accommodations. So, do they um, need to hold off from any high stakes testing, avoiding extra um, coursework, having a little extra time to complete essays, these kinds of things. And the principle on returning to learn is that we return in a gradual fashion, kind of in a stair step pattern. So this is um, a little bit small, but the principle is that you rest, you really don't do a whole lot because generally after a concussion people do want to rest. And then incrementally you add in activities. So spending 15 minutes at a time focusing. And then if that goes well, spending 30 minutes. And then if you can do an hour or two at home, you can go back to a half day of school. And then after that, you can go back to a full day. Question? Yeah, uh, the question is, yeah, is there a sensitivity to light in concussion? Absolutely. Um, and so sometimes people do want to rest in a dark area. Sometimes it helps to wear sunglasses. Mm -hmm. So, how do you know when to take each one of those steps? Is there a difference? Yeah, the question is how do you know how to progress based on how you're feeling? So, if you can concentrate for 15 minutes, you do that a few times over a course of a day. The next day, you go up to 30 minutes at a time. Next day, you do an hour or two at home. Next day, you go back to a half day of school. Physical rest. So, physical rest. Um, there, the evidence on actually arresting someone from concussion is pretty sparse. We don't have great, great science behind our recommendation to tell people to rest. Partly is we don't want you to get hit in the head again, and we know about this window of vulnerability. Partly is we think you get better faster, but I would say it's, it's somewhat of an open question. And so largely this is guided by expert opinion. We clearly do not want to return people to play on the same day. And we think that it's safe to go back once your concussion symptoms have resolved. There's also some interesting evidence about patients who've had symptoms for three weeks or longer. And that evidence talks about actually people benefiting from some low intensity cardiovascular activity 
to actually increase heart rate, increase blood flow, and perhaps you know, hasten their recovery. And so initially, we really, really rest. And then if your symptoms are better, you gradually return. Mm -hmm. But in some cases with prolonged symptoms, sometimes we do uh, gen you know, recommend some low uh, intensity cardiovascular activity. Your typical simple return to play, say for a typical high school football player, would look like this. So they return to my office, they've rested, they have zero symptoms of their concussion. Often they are itching to get back and really feeling much better. They're back 100% at school. What we would do is over the course of five days get back into play. So that looks like this. The student athlete would go back to light aerobic activity on day one. They would do 15 to 20 minutes on a stationary bike and make sure that they had no symptoms. We have, we're lucky in San Francisco, we have athletic trainers at all of our public high schools and they're in touch with our student athletes who have concussion and so they check in with them um, and make sure that they don't have symptoms with each of these steps. Sometimes when you have a concussion and you go out and you do physical activity, some, maybe your headache comes back. And if that's the case, then you come back here and rest a bit more. But if you do well with 15 or 20 minutes of bike, you can go on to sports-specific activity. So doing some drills on your own. And then the next day, you would do non-contact training. So you've returned to the team and you're drilling with your team. Then I like to see the student athlete back in clinic and make sure that they feel good. I run them through tests again make sure that they're 100% better. And if they are, I return them to a full contact practice. If they still feel good, then they return to a, a full game. If at any point they get symptoms, they take a step back and go back to where they were previously feeling good. Question? So the question is, with these clinician clearances, how much is subjective versus objective? Very much of concussion treatment right now is subjective, having to do with how is the person feeling? Some of it is objective. Balance testing is really important. The neuropsychological testing on computer also plays a role, and basic pen and pencil memory testing. So it's a combination, but I do rely a lot on the person telling me how they're feeling. Mm -hmm. So the question is, the headache then when someone has a concussion, is it super intense or just could be any kind of headache? And it's very variable. I would say um, patients who have a history of headaches especially migraine, can have, it can bring out migraine type symptoms. And those patients sometimes have a risk of having longer symptoms because a concussion will irritate the migraine syndrome. But, um, but no, it's, it can be quite variable. Headache can be a small part of what someone's going through or a big part. And if you remember those spheres, you know, patients can have varying degrees of each of those spheres of symptoms. So I'll have some patients where it's really an issue of feeling foggy I have other patients where it's really a headache problem. I have other patients where it's much more a dizziness issue. You know, and people kind of vary. All right, so there's been, you know, a lot of focus about concussion this fall. I don't know if anyone saw the um, Frontline um, special on concussion. It's, uh, it's a good watch if you haven't seen it. It's all about chronic traumatic encephalopathy in the NFL, kind of long-term effects of concussion. Um, and so that's the question I get sometimes in clinic is, you know, hey, Dr. Center, should my son or daughter keep playing football, lacrosse, soccer? And so what are the long-term <laughs> effects of concussion? Post-concussion syndrome is one of them. There's a subset of patients, maybe around 10% of people, that have concussion symptoms that last longer, longer than four weeks, longer than six weeks. The vast majority of these people do get better in about within a year, but certainly, you know, one out of every 10 patients I see will have symptoms that just persist. We also know from the same NCAA study we talked about in JAMA from 2003, we know that a history of concussion is associated with longer recovery from subsequent concussions. So that comes from the data in this slide. If you look at this data, this is length of symptom recovery in players with concussion by history of concussion. So, they took athletes uh, and said, okay, how many previous concussions have you had? Zero, one, two, three. And then how long did it take for you to get better from this concussion? And you can see, if you look at the bottom line, thinking about prolonged symptoms, which in this study they defined as more than seven days, 
30% of the folks who had a history of three or more concussions had prolonged symptoms compared to seven and a half when you had no history of concussion. So we think that having a history of concussion puts you at risk for having symptoms that last longer. There is concern as well about potential long, long, long-term effects of concussion, which is um, the term is chronic traumatic encephalopathy, which has been uh, found in a number of former NFL football players on autopsy. I think the number is around 30 or 40. Uh, what's happened is these athletes have been diagnosed with dementia, depression, um, and uh, upon their death, they've had an autopsy. Their brain's been found to have a protein deposited, the tau protein, which is the same protein that's in Alzheimer's disease, as well as another um, other dementia, um, other types of dementia. It's very difficult to draw causality right now between the head injuries that occurred and chronic traumatic encephalopathy, but this really does raise concern about the effect of concussion and what we call subconcussive blows. Those are the hits that occur that don't result in symptoms. And what is the cumulative effect of repetitively having hits to your head? And so the question is, well, in my clinic, you know, is how many concussions is too many? You know, if, is there a magic number? Sometimes people ask me, well, you know, I've had four concussions. Should I just be done? You know, and there really is not a magic number for concussion right now. We don't, you know, there's, there's, it's not like, oh, well, you've had five in your life, so you shouldn't play um, soccer anymore. We don't really know that. What I talk to each athlete about, I think it's really an individualized conversation. So I talk to each athlete about, well, how many concussions have you had? Is it taking less and less force to get a concussion? Are you getting head injuries more frequently? We see that in people. So I'll have someone who comes in and they had maybe two concussions and all of a sudden their younger brother walks by and by accident hits them in the head and all the, you know, they've got terrible headaches for a week. Those, these are patterns that occur. Do they have increased severity of symptoms and increased duration? And how, what's their age? Are they, are they young? These are the things that I factor into thinking about you know, how many concussions is too many. And what I like to do is talk to the student athlete about really choosing a lower risk sport. My hope is always not to take someone out of sports, of course. I'm a sports medicine doctor. I like sports. Um, I, my hope is always to choose a sport that's lower risk and safer. So the question is, uh, there's a concern, a concerning association between elite sports and dementia. And so why, why then are girls higher risk for concussion if we're not seeing more females with dementia down the line? Is that kind of, am I interpreting that correctly? Well, I, you know, I think honestly, I don't, I'm not sure in this, uh, um, this I abstracted from uh, this first reference. I think, I think in, this ref, in this statement, elite actually means professional. Um, and the data about dementia related to professional sports is out there, but, but incomplete. And so we don't have a lot of information. The data we have has to do with the mostly male athletes in collision sports, boxing, NFL football, hockey, um, with these changes. The, we don't have autopsy data on female pro athletes that I know of. So, the, so why would girls have a higher risk of concussion than boys? You know, I think the... Um, it's, we don't know. There are lots of different ideas why. Um, there's a thought that perhaps it has to do with neck strength. So um, boys having uh, more neck strength typically than girls, and that might be protective um, from concussion. There's data on both sides of that hypothesis. Um, there's the idea of concussion being such a subjective diagnosis, and perhaps girls offer their symptoms or present their symptoms more than boys do and that the incidence is actually the same. It's just that we pick them up more often in girls than boys. Um, there, you know, you can hypothesize. It's interesting to think about why this might be, I, but we, it's not been worked out. Mm -hmm. So the question is, well, I said earlier that a, con that a helmet doesn't reduce the rate of concussion. Helmets for football uh, were designed to prevent skull fracture, and they're really good at that. That's, that is what they do there. Um, but presently, yeah, there's not a helmet design that has been shown to reduce the risk of concussion. All right, so we'll talk about prevention more. It's a good segue. 
Uh, we've talked a lot about the upcoming research uh, in concussion, and really there's a lot going on um, across the country and across the world uh, trying to figure out more uh, details about concussion. First is what is the injury, and we talked a little bit about this, you know, trying to quantify the types of head impact that cause concussion, trying to quantify that by player position, by sport, and, and what types of impact, again, is it a linear force or a shear force? Is there a particular um, threshold, you know, of number of hits that you should not exceed? Is there a maximum threshold that you should not exceed? And what are the cumulative effects of head impact in sport? Different studies have looked at this, looking, there's some interesting data about soccer players and heading. Um, interestingly, heading is a little bit controversial in soccer and has not definitively been shown to cause concussion. It's going up for a header is risky, so when you go up for a header, you end up sometimes crashing into the opposing player, getting elbowed, et cetera, and clearly that leads to concussion. But simply heading the ball is somewhat controversial. Heading the ball, though, repetitively have been, has been shown to have changes on advanced imaging, such as um, sort of advanced MRI scans, and that's raising concern about, you know, should we be uh, having our little kids do repetitive heading exercises and things like that? More to come, I think, as years pass on that. <laughs> so, so her son plays soccer, and he likes to juggle the ball on his head. Is this, you know, is he at risk? You know, I think we don't know. I think the, um, the changes that have been seen are changes that aren't correlated with any clinical meaning. And so we have some brain scans, but how to, how to apply them to your son yeah. is we don't know yet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Does the impact actually have to go over? Yeah, good question. So is the, does the impact for a concussion have to be to the head or can it be to another part of the body? It can absolutely be to any part of the body, uh, anything that causes a force to the head. You know, so there needs to be some movement of the brain within the skull, but it doesn't need to be a blow to the brain, to the head. There, um, not that I've read, not serially. It's it's a little bit unusual to have um, uh, to have a diving concussion. Most divers, um, I mean, it would it's pretty unusual that a diver um, ends up doing that. But um, but I have seen one or two, and so far, uh, just because they haven't placed their hands properly as they enter the water. I have not seen any um, studies, I think just because the incidence is low. Yes? Are there any studies on how it affects bicycle helmets are? Any studies on how effective bicycle helmets are in preventing concussion, not that I have read. Yes? <clears throat> yes, the question was about, there are mouthpieces out there uh, that measure forces. Um, no data on the mouthpieces. Uh, there is data from uh, the East Coast on sensors, accelerometers, and helmets, and that's the best data we have right now about uh, concussion, or sort of, I should say, head impacts and how they relate to concussion. And you know, it's not it's not conclusive. I would say they they've quantified a little bit um, as far as which positions have which kinds of forces, but, uh, but not enough that I could apply it to my high school football team. <laughs> now, so the question is, is it possible to have a complete recovery from a concussion? We think so. Uh, for, for years and years, we've always, uh, we've said, you know, a concussion is something that you totally recover from. Once you're recovered, it's like you press the reset button, you're back, no worries. Um, a little bit, I think, as we get better at imaging, we may find that that's not entirely true or that that takes a bit longer than we thought. You know, there may be changes that are in the brain um, where we don't see them clinically, but they're there. All right, other prevention things. This is an interesting uh, program that's happening in youth ice hockey in Minnesota where they're really trying to affect behavioral change, really trying to change a little bit the culture of youth ice hockey by instilling a new point system. And what they're doing, it's called the Fair Play Program, where they've created something called Fair Play Points. And what happens is a team is awarded if they don't use all their penalty minutes. Fair Play Points are subtracted if the team uses more than their allotted penalty minutes. And these penalty minutes are high stakes. They factor into postseason play. And they've studied this and found that actually this is effective in reducing injuries and reducing concussion. So that's happening currently youth, youth hockey. The NFL football, of course, has in, included many rule changes recently to try to reduce the risk of concussion. 
The NFL, there's no same day return to play. There are fines. If you hit to the head, they've limited the number of contact practices. The Ivy League has limited the number of contact practices. The NCAA has instilled a 15-yard penalty for hitting a defenseless player above the shoulders. Peewee ice hockey has taken out body checking. So various things uh, to try to reduce the risk of head injury. In our program, we really think that education is important in reducing uh, the risk in, of concussion, or I should say treating it properly. We do think early recognition and proper treatment helps kids get better faster and back to play. So we emphasize knowing the symptoms, if in doubt, sit it out. We ask the student athletes to have responsibility for themselves and their teammates. And we emphasize that it's not OK to pretend that someone doesn't have a head injury. It's also important to really know the athletes. Because concussion diagnosis right now is very subjective, the better we can know our student athletes, the better our ability to diagnose them and the more comfortable they'll feel coming to us with, thing, with their concerns. And so it's important to have certified athletic trainers on the sidelines of our football teams and on, in our, in our uh, training rooms at our high schools, not just for football, but for all the sports really, so that the student athletes feel comfortable coming to that person. It's helpful to have team physicians right there on the sideline as well so that the diagnosis can happen right as it occurs. We do focus on a team approach at UCSF in identifying concussions. Every year, our athletic trainers reach out to officials and coaches and educate on concussion. The student athletes have education. And like I said, we ask them to monitor their teammates and themselves and notify us if they have any concerns. We have ATCs, certified athletic trainers at the schools, and team physicians as well. This program is called UCSF Play Safe. And like I said, it's an outreach program to the public schools in San Francisco and Marin, as well as a few private schools in the area. It involves an athletic trainer at the high schools and doctor on the sideline. We perform pre-participation physical exams on about five to 600 student athletes every spring. During that, we do a concussion history. We offer computerized baseline testing for patients, for student athletes who want to take a baseline neuropsychological test if they're in a high risk sport so that we have a baseline, you know, if they were to have a concussion. And again, we think that early recognition is really important and if in doubt, sit out. Lastly, we have the concussion clinic. These are the high schools that we cover and I'm the team doctor at Washington as well as Redwood and Marin. And then we have our concussion clinic, again, the Bay Area Concussion and Brain Injury Program, which is a multidisciplinary program involving us, the sports medicine physicians, neurosurgery, physical medicine and rehab, two neuropsychologists, a pediatric neurologist, a physical therapist. It's very comprehensive. And what we offer is really a multidisciplinary approach to treat sports-related concussion. Yeah. So the question is, is anything like the play safe happening in the East Bay? I know that uh, through Children's Oakland, there is an organized group of athletic trainers. Um, that is about all I know. How does the play safe program work? Do we actually attend games? Yes, <laughs> many games. So the athletic trainers, depending on the school, the athletic trainers are there at least one half day a week to every day of the week in the afternoons. Um, there's a high school training room in the high school where the athletic trainer works. The student athletes are welcome to come and go, ask questions if they have injuries. They can have treatment like stretching, um, sometimes icing, heating. Uh, the athletic trainers can teach therapeutic rehab exercises. The athletic trainers also act as an amazing link between us and the high school, the physicians, so they help us get patients in quickly to our clinic because they're right there. And so if you know, they might call me from a high school you know, basketball game, ah, Dr. Center, can I get, you know, I've got so-and-so, he has a swollen knee, knee here in basketball, can we get him into your clinic tomorrow? So it's a really nice way to make sure that our student athletes are cared for right away when they have injuries. And the MDs do go to games. It's actually a law in California that you have to have a physician on the sideline of football. So they can't start the game before I get there. Varsity football. Like I said, the Bay Area Concussion and Brain Injury Program at UCSF, we see acute sports-related concussion. Our goal is to see those within a few days of injury. 
and we have a multidisciplinary clinic for post-concussion syndrome, so sports concussions where the symptoms have lasted longer. I put in our contact information in case um, you have a case or questions. This is the best way to reach us, which is our email, concussion at ucsf.edu. And I also put in your handout a few concussion resources in case you're not close to UCSF and you need information on concussion. The first is the Consensus Statement on Concussion in Sport, which is published by the American Medical Society for Sports Medicine. And what that has is all the evidence for concussion treatment up to date, how we practice sports concussion care here in the US. The second item there is a link to the American Medical Society for Sports Medicine, which is our uh, professional institution for primary care sports medicine doctors, people like myself who practice all over the country. Anyone on this list should be able to treat sports-related concussions, so it's a great resource if you or a family member is looking for a doctor in your area. Lastly on here, I put the reference for the Center for Disease Control sports concussion toolkit and what that offers is a lot of great information on what is a concussion what are the symptoms and also handouts that you can give to your coach um, other parents how to recognize concussion so i'll leave you with these pearls about concussion the first is to have a high index of suspicion because we know that concussions are under recognized the second is if in doubt sit them out if you're worried about a concussion, it's better to rest than to go back and get assessed first before you go back. Usually symptoms resolve in seven to 10 days. The treatment for concussion is cognitive and physical rest. And you wanna follow a stepwise return first to school or work and then to play. So I wanna thank you for your attention and all the great questions. And, um, and now we have time for lots more questions. So uh, I think I'll start here. Yeah, um, so actually my birthday. Yeah, good question. So the question is, uh, so his daughters are coming to do a baseline test tomorrow. And should they get concussed and they take a neuropsychological test and we have their baseline so we can compare, let's say they feel 100% better, but they failed their baseline. Then what? And really, these computerized tests are really, a t we think of it as a tool in the toolbox and not as a hard stop. So I put most stock in the total global assessment and my feeling of, is the student athlete better or not? If I have um, strong concerns about the neuropsychological test, it causes me pause, you know, and I think it's a really good red flag to, to make sure that the student athlete is being honest with me, with their parents, with themselves about how they're feeling. Um, if they are, and I feel really confident that they've recovered, I won't hold them up because they, you know, bombed the computer test. Yeah. yeah the question is, how uneven uh, is concussion care across the country? Uh, I would agree with you. I think it's very uneven. Uh, we know concussions under recognized, um, and concussion care, it de you know, it's very variable, uh, depending on the level of training of the person that you see. The question is, is there a different treatment protocol for post-concussion syndrome? Um, and what, tell me the second part. Is there any data on the recovery rate? rate that and is there any data on recovery rate uh, for post-concussion syndrome? So the um, treatment for post-concussion syndrome, I start to think about pharmacologic treatment uh, and medication, prescription medication sometimes. Depending on, you know, most patients will have a, like I said, some most patients will have a focus of their symptoms. So in some patients, it might be a migraineous type headache. And in those patients, I, um, I work with our neurologist in our multidisciplinary clinic, and we come up with a medication regimen to help with those migraine symptoms. In other patients, it might be trouble falling asleep. And so again, uh, we work together and think about a medication that can help with sleep. Often I'll incorporate exercise, and often I'll um, rely on our physical therapist who's excellent with working with dizziness and balance rehab. She'll help out in recovery as well. So it's um, really a multidisciplinary approach. Sometimes there uh, we um, ask for help from our neuropsychologist to do a really thorough cognitive evaluation to help with more subtle memory difficulties or word finding problems. Um, and from there, you know, we, we help the person return. The rate of recovery is really high. 
So the vast majority of people with post-concussion syndrome recover within a year. Oh, yeah. So in the beginning of the talk, I said, well, I think in five years, treatment is going to be different. And how, how would I envision that? Um, I think there's a lot of work being done to think about uh, pharmacologic or nutritional supplements that could help someone, that could help expedite recovery. When you think about the pathophysiology that's occurring in concussion, this energy crisis, um, there are people uh, in researching traumatic brain injury, uh, severe brain injury. I should say concussion is classified as an MTBI, mild traumatic brain injury. Severe brain injury is called TBI, traumatic brain injury. There's a lot of data in TBI that we sort of abstract to concussion. And there's a lot of research being done in TBI about antioxidants and things like that to help expedite recovery. I think that's going to trickle down, and we'll see some of that in concussion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, there's a huge role for, um, for everyone to be educated about concussion. That's exactly the point, which is to say that um, concussion treatment can be done by all of us. You know, it's, it's a matter of... Um, really recognizing that there is a concussion and then, a, you know, resting. Ultimately, because of the laws, we are seeing more patients in clinic with concussion because um, it's important to clear them to return them to play, and that came because concussion, you know, kids with concussion were being returned before they were better. Um, but yes, absolutely, I think uh, concussion treatment can be done by a bystander. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so how many concussions is too many? I, the Really what I look at is that athlete and how they're doing. So what's the pattern of their injury? There's, there's no magic number right now, so that I, there's no you know, three strikes, you're out. Uh, but let's say the student athlete tells me, well, I got a concussion um, uh, you know, six weeks ago, and then I just got a second concussion, and I barely got hit. And now I feel worse than I did the first time around. That's, to me, that's a real red flag. And it means to me that something's going on where they're more vulnerable than they should be. And so that causes me pause. And that's when I start to think about you know, having that discussion about choosing a lower risk sport. So the question is, what's the criteria? Um, when would you order a CT scan or a brain MRI for someone? Really, um, the CT scan is, is really good at finding blood. And so if I'm worried about a bleed in the brain, I will order a CT scan. It's also very good at looking for fractures, fractures of the face, skull fractures. MRI of the brain um, is very good at looking at subtle abnormalities in the cortex of the brain and the soft tissue. So I would use that down the line, say, if someone um, with a concussion maybe had a new set of migraine symptoms, you know, a new very severe headache, and we were looking for a focal problem. In your standard concussion treatment, though, neither CT or MRI has been very helpful because they both tend to be normal. So the question is, in some situations, um, you hear of cases where someone has no symptoms and then 24 hours later they're found to have died from a hemorrhage in their brain. Um, you know, that's, I think, very unusual, but could happen. And um, there's, at some point, I would think that that person would have some symptoms, you know, headache, et cetera. Um, and that is why we monitor closely, you know, these things do evolve. Sometimes a brain bleed will be quite slow, and that's why you monitor and make sure that someone is, um, you know, stable. So the uh, question is about headgear and soccer, and do those prevent concussion? Um, so far, there's no definitive data that the headgear and soccer prevents concussion. There are teams that wear headgear and soccer, of course, um, here in the Bay Area and elsewhere, uh, to try to prevent concussion, but the data is not there. And, um, you know, often in sports medicine, it's interesting, you think about protective gear as being protective. Yeah. You can argue the opposite, of course, which is to say that if you pad yourself up a lot, are you going to play more aggressively and ultimately sustain more injuries? That's kind of the double-edged sword, you know, of protective gear in sports medicine. So, um, you know, we don't know about head protection right now and, and, the de and concussion, though uh, obviously it's a huge area of interest and, and a push in trying to reduce the risk of concussion. Mm -hmm. So the question is about the um, airbag that's out there in the Netherlands that, you know, you can wear as this kind of cool, um, like, collar device, which appeals, right, because you don't have to wear a helmet and your hair doesn't get mushed and stuff. It's, I think, two thumbs up on that. But um, um, does that have a role in reducing the risk of sports-related concussion? Don't know yet. 
Yeah, the question's about uh, auto racing helmets and the, the foam and auto racing helmets. You know, I, I don't know. I actually have no experience um, covering auto racing. We have one of our um, sports medicine surgeons does race cars, so I'll have to ask him about what he knows about concussion and auto racing. Um, it's a great question, and yeah, I, I have to say I don't know to that one. Right, so the question is, you know, in the NFL, the concern this season has been, well, you know, you're not hitting to the head. Instead, you're going to blow out my knee, you know, and, and all right, I'd rather have a concussion than a multi-ligament knee injury where it's going to be, a, you know, a re ACL reconstruction in nine months till I can run. So um, there is a trade-off, you know. I think, again, looking at evidence, we don't have any evidence to indicate that. I mean, there's no... Um, there's no hard and fast um, data on that, but I think that's always the concern is, you know, you're, you're trading one injury for another. Yes, yeah, so the question is, you know, as athletes get bigger, stronger, faster, what does that do to concussion risk? And I think intuitively you'd think, yeah, it increases the risk of concussion, um, but, you know, no data to support that. But, yeah, I think the bigger, stronger, faster athletes, certainly the risk of injury generally in, in a collision sport is higher. Yes. Yeah, so thinking about the mechanism of concussion, what's the difference between a linear and a shear force? So a linear force means, you know, straight on. And a shear force is more like a, a glancing force. Uh, and there's some thought that because the injury has to do with a stretching of the neurons in the brain, that perhaps the shear force is actually the more injurious of the two. All right, I will be up here for questions if there are more, and I really appreciate everyone coming and all the great questions. Thank you.